number of mass shootings each year is climbing, according to findings by the nonprofit The Violence Project that researches mass shootings and studies potential warning signs. Dr. James Densley is one of the authors, and he is joining us once again live tonight. Uh, we appreciate you coming on. I want to start uh, where we left off with the sheriff with these threats of violence. Mass shooting events sadly are common to have these types of threats afterwards, but how often are these threats credible? Yeah, that's the, the troubling question. And my heart goes out to the community, but also to the sheriff and, and his officers at the moment having to deal with all this. We've seen in the uh, in, in mass shooting scenarios, we studied 170 mass shootings going back to 1966. And in about half of those incidents, there was what we would call leakage, which is that there was a telegraphing of the intent of some sort of violent uh, communication. And it was most common among the youngest school shootings. Um, and so in about half of those cases, this is what's happening. Now, at the same time, there are hundreds of threats. Many are hoaxes, uh, many are jokes, which are, of course, not very funny. And sifting through them is really difficult because there's no national standard uh, and, and no sort of clear guidance for how to go about doing this. And all policing is local, all schooling is local. So many times communities are trying to deal with these, th these threats on a local level, and they might not necessarily have the resources to do this well and effectively, particularly if they're being inundated. Now, one last thing, though, which is really important, which is to say, in the study that we did, looking at leakage among mass shootings, uh, and when we put this communication of intent, what we found it was often a cry for help. So these were individuals who were looking for some sort of response. And I think that's really important when we think about how to respond to warning signs and prevent the next mass shooting. And so how do you intervene at that point? What do you do if you spot that warning sign? What's the next step? You know, it's a bit of a cliche and adage to say, you know, if you see something, say something. The challenge often is somebody's then got to do something. And we don't have at times clear communication about where to report threats or where to report concerns if you're worried about somebody. So we often advocate for centralized or anonymous reporting systems. Sometimes these can operate at a district level, but maybe even at a statewide level, so that you can then triage these threats and recognize, do these need a law enforcement intervention or some other sort of intervention? Because it might not necessarily need a punitive response, but it needs some sort of response. This also means we've got to train teachers, we've got to train young people in schools, we've got to train parents. Everybody's got to be on the same page about where to report, how to report, what to report, and then what the response is going to look like afterwards. Right, to penetrate that cone of silence, because as you had told me last night, people feel as though they're being a snitch. Uh, that's not the case, but we need a system in place where we can trust that what we say gets investigated. You have been following trends in your research. Anything that you have noticed um, in terms of what motivates a mass shooter, especially those in the K through 12 age group? Yeah, so often there's this search for motive uh, after a, a tragic shooting like this. And to some ways, trying to chalk it up to one thing or the other is a bit of a distraction because what we find is that the pathway to violence is often quite long. And the pathway to violence is maybe a slow build over time. But we do see these commonalities, which is that many uh, shooters have a history of childhood trauma. Uh, there's something that's gone on in their early childhood, which is a sort of foundation for the violence that follows. I mentioned uh, yesterday when I was on the show about reaching an identifiable crisis point. It sort of overwhelms your coping mechanisms. And in many times, it's a point where you think that you no longer want to uh, live uh, and it becomes a suicidal crisis. And so the shooting is your final act. It's intended to be that way of making the world see you for who you are. The other thing that shooters have in common is they often study other shooters. And so there is this contagion element of the script for violence that people are following. And then, of course, it's about opportunity and it's about access. And this is really where we need uh, to keep hitting home this idea around safe storage of firearms and making it difficult for young people to get access 
to the people, the places, but also the tools to perpetrate this type of violence in the first place. A lot we can learn digging into the data. Dr. James Densley with The Violence Project, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.